Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are once again going to talk in our series on business ethics and CSR. Today we are going to talk on holistic approach of decision making and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College, University of Delhi. A prolific, a dynamic professor who believes in giving her best. She is an author of numerous books and uh, she is appreciated and admired by the students and academicians worldwide. Friends, we know that you have lots of queries and to give answers to your queries, we have a provision for you. You can call us, contact us through our toll-free number through the live session and ask questions through Dr. Namita Rajput. Our contact number that is our toll-free number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat our number is 1-800-110-430. You are just requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture as well as you are requested to ask questions relevant to the topic only. Now I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Rajput and would request her to explain us in detail the today's topic. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Good morning friends. Today we have a very important topic called holistic approach to decision making. Decision making as such is a very important activity wherein when many parameters are analyzed, examined and then only we are moving on to taking a good decision. But when you talk about the ethical, holistic decision making process, that means whatever decisions we have to take, we have to see the ethical lens behind it, the, the benefits, uh, the outcomes which are going to come after taking uh, the decisions, we have to analyze each and every parameter relating to uh, the holistic uh, decision making process which has a strong ethical lens and it should not harm anyone. So that is all the, uh, the principles relating to ethics are embedded into the holistic decision making. And this kind of a decision making is definitely a very difficult decision making because you have to see uh, the outcomes uh, very, very precisely and uh, you should see that uh, the decisions which you take are, is not going to harm anyone for that matter. It is going to give the enduring benefits to the people at large. So decision making, um, which when you call it as uh, the holistic decision making is a very important decision making which you take and embed at every level of the decision making and then only we will we are going to take uh, the the things forward now coming on to the decision making the decision making is the process of selecting a course of action among the multiple alternatives so one thing you have to keep in mind that whether it is a normal decision making or it is a holistic decision making first you have to see that what are the various parameters taken into account and then you have to see the various alternatives which are present for you to analyze. Every decision uh, making process produces a final choice. Not only this, it begins when we need to do something we do not know about what shopping. Decision, deciding what to eat, deciding whom to vote and for an election etc. Now as such, when you talk about the decision making process, it is an intellectual activity which is definitely uh, very, very important uh, in which you analyze first, you collect all the various alternatives which are there for you. You have to make a very intelligent and a diligent choice as far as the uh, selection of the final parameter and the final selection uh, amongst the alternative is concerned. And after doing that, you have to make a good choice, but that choice has to be seen from the ethical lens, be it a decision making of uh, any things which you have to shop for your family, be it a decision making relating to uh, have a choice for the election uh, of the people and uh, not only this, even what to eat decides uh, taking into alternatives various options. So decision making process at every walk of life, at every step of life has to be very diligently done. You have to give a list of the choice to yourself. You have to analyze each and every choice to yourself. You have to see which choice suits you the most. And finally, you have to see that, yes, this is the, the choice which I have to take and take it forward. So, but you, when you talk about uh, the ethical and the business ethics, the holistic uh, decision making is very important decision. But yes, the basics remains the same. That is, you have to take into uh, account the various alternatives. 
you have to select one of them that is the best and then finally you have to take that yes this is the best choice amongst us and then you have to move it forward. Now there are uh, n number of alternatives which are there in front of you, there are n number of considerations involved when you have to take a decision making and uh, when you talk into uh, take into consideration the large number of considerations which are there for you to take the important decision making these are called as DSS that is decision support systems which is also called as computer based systems are developed to assist the decision makers in uh, considering the implications of various courses of action. Now as a matter of choice as an individual you have to see this that uh, when you have to take a final decision making as far as the holistic decision making is concerned or a normal decision making is concerned you have to see what are the basic parameters and the considerations which are available for you. These decision making process and different alternatives are so important that uh, they assist you in uh, the decision making process which is the need of today and of course uh, each and every considerations will be analyzed keeping into consideration the various implications of the various courses of action. Now as a matter of choice if you have to take a decision you have to see each and every consideration or the decision support system which is available for you to take a decision you have to analyze the outcomes you have to analyze the implications. The implications have to be very diligently analyzed because this is the main thing which you have to see when you have to take a decision. The implications and outcomes have to be very very good only then you will be able to take up the choice. Now coming on to the decision making process. The decision making process is a very important intellectual intelligent activity which involves a series of steps. Now these series of steps have to be taken into consideration and you cannot bypass any of the steps. So we call it as a process, a process has a series of action to be taken and only then you will be coming on to the final output. The first is you have to define the problem, unless and until the problem is in front of you how can you decide the process, how can you even initiate the process. So the first thing which you have to do is you have to define a problem in a very diligent way. The most significant step in any decision making process is describing why a decision is called for identifying the most desired outcomes of the decision making process. One way of deciding if a problem exists is to define the problem in terms of what one wanted or expected and the actual situation. So one way of deciding if the problem exists is to define the problem in terms of what one wanted or expected and the actual situation. So you have to define the, uh, the problem in terms of what it is and what you want and after that a problem is defined as the difference between the expected outcomes and the actual outcomes because there the difference comes and there the problem is defined more intelligently. Now this is a very critical consideration uh, as far as the decision making is concerned because this is how you have to define the causes and the search for the solutions. So uh, after taking into consideration these uh, critical considerations uh, that is how one defines a problem determines how one defines the causes and searches for the solution. Now when you decide upon the, uh, the holistic decision making process, the first thing which we have done is to define a problem in a very significant manner. Secondly, you have to now identify the various alternatives to the solutions. So when you have to find uh, that you have selected the problem uh, at the forefront, now is the time to uh, identify the solutions. Because unless and until you identify the solutions you will not be able to crack the problems or you will not be able to solve the problems. So identifying the alternative solutions to a problem is the second step as far as the decision making process is concerned. The decision makers should not limit themselves to obvious alternatives or what has worked in the past but has to be open with the new and better alternatives. They should consider as many alternatives they can realistically. 
The decision makers should consider more than five alternatives in most of the cases. They should not have only two opposing choices, either this or that. So now coming on to the analysis of this point. The decision making is a very difficult thing because if you take a wrong decision, then if you take a wrong path, the directions would be wrong, the decisions uh, taken would be wrong and the whole organization will be put on a reverse path that is a path of destruction, a path of titanic. So when you have to decide upon that these are the alternative solutions that this is the problem and th these are the solutions, so you should not come out with only two solutions, either this or that. You should have a series of the solutions in front of you and because as a decision maker, you cannot uh, stop in the pursuit of finding out the alternatives. The more alternatives you have, the more, more open mindedness you have, the more good for the organization, for that organization. Why? Because if you put a limit to the pursuit of your solutions, then of course, nothing is uh, good happening for you. If you have an open vision for farsightedness, then of course, uh, the things uh, would be in coming into the favor of you. So, that is why you have to identify the, uh, the solutions and coming on to a series of solution, not this or that. And uh, of course, uh, with the many alternatives uh, which you can and coming on to the real, uh, realistically, the decision making should consider more than five alternatives in most of the cases because uh, there is a reason for one or two, uh, you know, the process to be a failure, then of course, it would be better. So, they should not have only two opposing choices, either this or that. Then, the most important third step as far as the decision making process is concerned, we have discussed the two, that is first you have to define the problem and two, you have to find out the alternatives to the solution. Now, is the third point that is you have to evaluate the identified alternatives. For example, we have uh, decided at least four to five courses of action. Now is the time to find out which one suits you the most. That is each and every alternative will be sorted out uh, with its all pros and cons, with its all benefits and uh, you know the disadvantages or the advantages and disadvantages. So that when you come on to a final decision making process, you are completely and absolutely perfect in taking the decisions. So, evaluating alternatives, the decision makers should look at likely positive and negative sides of each uh, alternative. It is unusual to find one alternative that would completely solve the problem and is better than all others. Decision makers should develop a confidence course for each alternative. That is, if I go for alternative A with 95 percent of confidence, I can say that we are perfect in taking a decision making. Similarly, if you have about five alternative courses of action, you must develop the confidence score after analyzing each and every one of it with, uh, with a lot of intelligence, with lot of diligence, with lot of uh, you know the, the facts uh, and the empirical evidences to this effect that yes, if I go for this, this is the confidence rate. If I go for this, this is the confidence rate. So, you have to uh, you know calculate all the alternative uh, scores uh, that is the confidence uh, scores for each alternative and of course, the alternative which is giving you the best uh, score will be selected. So, the decision making should develop uh, the confidence scores for each alternative which is available and uh, he needs to determine not just the results of each alternative could yield but how probable it is that those results will be realized. If evaluation is based on the fact, it is likely that the expected outcomes will occur. Now coming on to the fourth point, let me give you a recap of what the three points were all about. The first point was you have to define uh, the problem. After defining the problem, you have to find out and identify the alternative solutions uh, to the problem. And of course, you have to uh, select at least five of them. The third is you have to evaluate the alternatives, uh, uh, you know, you have to evaluate each and every alternative identified in front of you because you have to be very specific about 
calculating the outcomes, uh, the pros and cons and finally, you will take a uh, good decisions. You, you have to calculate the, the confidence scores of the various alternatives which are available. And of course, the evaluation is based on the facts, not on your whims and fancies. So, that is expected outcomes will occur. Now, the fourth point is you have to make a decision. You have everything in front of you. You have the problem in front of you. You have the alternatives in front of you. You have analyzed each and every alternative which was there in front of you. Now is the time to take a decision. After evaluating the alternatives against the accepted criteria, the managers uh, screen the non-feasible alternatives and select the most appropriate alternative that will help to achieve the desired objectives. Alternatives can be selected through the following approaches. First, experience. The past experience serves as a guide for the future. Managers follow their past actions, their success and failures, analyze them in the context of the future environment and select the most suitable alternative fit in the present solution. Now, this is a very important uh, thing to be uh, you know talked about and considered that is you have to finally make a decision. Now, after defining the problem, after making the list of the alternatives, after analyzing each and every alternative, now is the time and developing the confidence uh, scores, now is the time to make a decision. Decision making is most important activity for any type of organization, for any work of life, for any decision taken at a personal level because here your intellect uh, has to be used, your uh, you know the, the basic things have to be used and you have to be very diligent and intelligent uh, in taking out the best out of the alternatives which are available. So, how do we do that? The first thing which is available is experience. Experience is the father of taking any kind of good decision making because they are the guiding force, they are the driving force, they are the motivating force. If the experience says that yes, that this is the way it should be, follow that. Experience is something which has no alternative. They are the guiding force which will guide you and make your pursue in the right direction and uh, which will tell you that yes, the probability of the success would be more if you follow the experience. So, the past experience serves as a guide for the future and the managers follow their past actions, their success and failures, they have to analyze them in the context of the future environment and select the most suitable alternative fit in the present solution. Next is your experimentation. Some people are you know innovators, some people are happy to take experiments, some people are happy to explore new things. So, now is the time to uh, the second way of taking a decision making through experimentation. In experimentation, each alternative is put to practice and one which is most suited is selected. This method is costly as implemented of every alternative to the decision making situation involves heavy capital expenditure. Testing each alternative therefore, is not possible. Also, this method may be suited in the present circumstances only. The selected courses of action should meet the future requirements also. So, now coming on to the analysis of the second type of uh, you know the, the way of taking a decision making. The first one which we have discussed was the experience which is the most important guiding force to take the future actions. Now, is the time to discuss the second one that is experimentation. Experimentation as the name suggests is exploring each and every alternative to its best. It involves huge capital expenditure and it is too time consuming and uh, probably uh, most of the organizations would not uh, go for this, but yes, where the precision has to be at the par excellence, where the precision has to be needed 100 percent, then each and every alternative will be put to practice with huge capital expenditure cost and the results of which alternative is the best will be selected. So, this is how we move on with the experimentation and of course, when you are selecting for this, you must have a futuristic approach 
that is the outcome should suit uh, should be suitable not only to the present but also to the future courses of action the next is your research and analysis it helps to search and analyze the impact of the future variables on the present situations apply various mathematical models and select the most suitable alternative this method is more suitable less costly in terms of time and money as compared to experimentation and experience now this is the present era is the era of knowledge is the era of research is the era of analysis what you do you do research and analysis of the alternatives of the all the variables which are there into consideration in your ambit and of course uh, you have to analyze the present situation the future situations you have to apply certain mathematicals and econometric models and uh, there are certain uh, research tools which are available uh, you know which are put to uh, the the lenses of which is the best there are certain threshold limits which are available that if the probability is less than 0.05 the alternative will be accepted if the probability is more than uh, 0.05 the null hypothesis is accepted stuff like that so we have certain thresholds uh, according to some p value according to some eigen values according to some correlation values uh, regression values there are certain structure equation modeling which are present uh, there is some uh, confirmatory factor analysis uh, you know and uh, we have certain good uh, research techniques which are available so what you do is you put your data and feed into those statistical softwares which are uh, very important uh, if you are analyzing the questionnaire or if you have some financial data it is put to that and after comparing the threshold limits with the realistic figures which you have then of course uh, the decision making is more empirical it is more authentic which is away from whims and fancies which are away from your personal biasness and of course the things would be better in the future because they are all based on the on the evidences which are practical in nature so the research and the analysis is perhaps most of the most authentic way of taking any kind of a decision making as far as the holistic uh, ethical decision making is concerned because it makes more sense when you are doing it empirically if you have some quants uh, which are available that is the quantitative figures the actual figures which are available and of course this method is more suitable less costly uh, that you know the the softwares are available with very less cost on the internet you pay it online download it saves your money and cost put the data into it if you have the secondary data put that into it if you have a primary data you have to convert that into a secondary data with some quantitative statistics and of course when everything is uh, uh, collated then the results are calculated uh, from these statistical softwares and this is perhaps the best one it saves your time money and energy and the results are more authentic and good now the fifth step is to implement the alternative the selected alternative should be implemented with the least resistance from the organizational members uh, the 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 things which you choose uh, should not be offended by any of the members of the organization they should support your decision making process and the implementation must be properly planned and those who will be affected by the implementation should be allowed to participate in the implementation process uh, to make it more effective and more fruitful the implementation of alternative should ensure the following things first selected alternative should be communicated to everyone the changes in the existing structure because of the implementation should also be communicated to everyone in the organization authority and responsibility uh, for the implementation should be specifically assigned and not only this the resources should be allowed to uh, you know the respective departments for carrying out the decisions the budget schedules procedures and the controls should be established to uh, ensure the effective implementation a committed workforce should be promoted unless everyone is committed to decision the desired outcomes will not be achieved and finally you have to evaluate the decisions the implementation process should be uh, regularly uh, paled by the members it should be supported by the members it should be evaluated uh, to the best possible extent thank you so much with this note thank you and thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session friends you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and would we'll be discussing more till be with us thank you
Hi friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on holistic approach of decision making. And for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a prolific professor as well as she is principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College, University of Delhi. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Rajput on today's topic, then do call us to our toll free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Rashbut, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome back to the session. Welcome back. Uh, in the first half, we discussed about the decision making. Decision making is something which requires the analysis of the various uh, parameters, considerations, and then we are move on, moving on to the best decision making process. It is basically uh, having a process behind it. And the process means a series of steps which have to be followed in the same sequence without bypassing the series, without bypassing anything. The first thing is uh, we have to define a problem. The uh, defining of the problem is the most uh, important and the primary thing which helps in the holistic decision making process and is uh, one of the prime steps in taking the decision making. One way of deciding if a problem exists is to define in terms of what we want and what is exactly the situation is. So, we are just trying to find out the situation of the expected outcomes and the actual outcomes to be. Then we have to find out the alternative uh, causes of action uh, which are available to solve the problem. And uh, finding out the alternatives is the uh, most important step and uh, it is not that you are able to only find out the two that is uh, this or that. You must have at least five of the alternatives uh, in front of you so that the probability of the success and the failure of each alternative is in front of you and you are able to have a good choice amongst the alternative so that you are able to coming on to the best decision making process. The next thing is to analyze. Uh, the, the existing alternatives which are available for you and uh, you have to I evaluate the identified alternatives which are present. The, uh, the presence of uh, so many alternatives is a kind of a problem for them because you have to unless and until you find out the confidence scores uh, you will not be able to take on the best. So, you compare the, the confidence scores which are available for each alternative which is in front of you. Uh, the, the evaluation process of which the confidence index is the highest, you will be selecting that because it is an intellectual activity wherein uh, there is there are there is no position and no place of wins and fancies. Now, the finally, you have to make a decision. Now, decision making uh, is through experience because experience is one of the most important guiding force and is the most motivating force in front of you because uh, the experience tells you the, the success stories, the failure stories of the yesteryears which are in a way the foundation for you to take a present decision. The next is your experimentation wherein you do a lot of experiments with the things and uh, and after uh, testing the each alternative whether it is possible or not and it involves huge capital expenditure and is the most costly way of analyzing the things. The next thing which we discussed were the research and analysis and this is perhaps the, the least uh, costly uh, probability which is in front of the people because the research and the analysis involves a lot of uh, you know the uh, good uh, econometric uh, reasoning and the modeling which are available with the low cost softwares which are available for you to analyze uh, econometric and mathematical models are put to uh, the screen as far as the quantitative and the qualitative data is concerned and both the quantitative and the qualitative data is put to these uh, econometric models and the softwares which is in front of them and it, it is easy for you to analyze the things because here everything is based on the uh, the uh, exact econometric uh, results, the thresholds which are available and uh, finally, uh, there is no room for your personal biasness uh, for that matter. 
then you implement uh, the alternative after comparing the confidence scores and uh, the, the threshold limits whatever way you adopt. Finally, is the time to adopt uh, the alternative in a very properly planned way. And uh, of course, the selected alternative should be uh, committed uh, to the organization as, the, as a whole. It must have a futuristic option in front of you. Uh, the, the if at all it is changing the existing structure uh, of the organization should, de should be acceptable to all. And uh, the uh, if it involves the changes in the authority and responsibility structures, again it should be uh, you know accepted by all the people of the organization because unless and until you have the support of the of the people at large in the organization, you will not be able to uh, find out the best way to do it. The resources should be allocated to respective departments for carrying out the decision making process. Now coming on to the budget, schedules, procedures, controls uh, should be established to ensure the effective implementation. Not only this, a committed workforce uh, should be promoted and unless and until everyone is committed to these uh, decisions, the desired outcomes will not be able to achieved. And finally, you have to evaluate the process that is the implementation process should be regularly by all the members done by all the members. The alternatives monitored to know its acceptance by the organizations should be regularly monitored through a progress report to see whether the objective for which it was selected has been achieved or not. If not, the managers should make corrections whenever necessary or make changes fingers implementation process and if yes such alternatives forms the basis for the future making. Now we are moving on to a holistic approach in the decision making process. Holistic means wholeness of an action in management or other disciplines of life. It seems the things as a whole are not in parts. The contemporary business environment is governed by these selfish motives. And not only this, the managers should uh, maximize for the business profits. Uh, workers wants to maximize the wages and suppliers wants to hire the higher prices from their suppliers and shareholders wants to maximize the dividends. Now we are moving on to the holistic decision making process. The holistic decision making process is perhaps the most intellectual activity which anyone could ever go for because here you have to analyze the alternatives which are available in a very scientific and a diligent manner because if any of the lapse comes the decision making which you have done will always be negative uh, for the organization in pursuit of your making the huge profits you will be on a reverse path. So that is why we call it that holistic approach to decision making is perhaps the most scientific way of taking the decisions. So holistic means the wholeness. Wholeness means that no parameter is left behind. And not only this, if you want to be uh, in the best of the management action, you have to analyze each and every approach to the best possible uh, deep extent. And it seems as a whole and not in uh, some of its own parts. So you have to be uh, very uh, carefully taking into consideration all the parameters, all the factors behind it. The contemporary business environment when you talk about is governed by the selfish motives. Nowadays we have uh, almost taking into consideration the profit making uh, objectives. The profit making is perhaps the, uh, the way it should be because unless and until the organization is on a sustainable path, you will not be able to give the best to the people. So the first thing which is required for the organization is to earn in a very sufficient way so that you are able to give uh, to your stakeholders at least whatever they have invested in that organization. So managers they have to maximize uh, their business profits. Uh, the workers have to be given the maximum wages. The suppliers have to be given uh, the prices uh, at a reasonable prices and the shareholder wants the, uh, the dividends to be paid to them to the highest possible extent because they have invested fortunes of their money in that. Everyone wants to be at its best and this is the beauty of the uh, holistic way of taking a decision making process. As a business, uh, contemporary business, if you talk about today, 
we have so many shareholders which are present in front of us and every shareholder have their own potential they have their own expectations uh, from the business so as a matter of fact we should not limit uh, their pursue of their excellence in fact we should put in their best efforts to give them the best the shareholders should be given the best uh, wages uh, the dividends the the workers should be given the best uh, wages the the investors should be given the best returns so this is how we move on with the holistic way of uh, taking any kind of a business decision making process if we rate the modern business to the ancient business there is a uh, there is a need to introduce a holistic uh, approach to the management and uh, if you talk about the yesteryears the management was not that perfect as we have today why because nowadays we have so many business schools the persons who enter as managers they have to have a required amount of qualifications they have to have uh, you know a particular situational test and other ways of analyzing their brains so after they qualify only then they are able to join that organization so as a matter of fact the contemporary organizations of today are entirely on a different continuum if you compare the yesteryear organizations it advocates to the growth and prosperity for everyone and for any kind of a shareholder it believes in vasudev kutumb vasudev kutumb means means what that means the whole world is a family and we should understand this the happiness to be given to all people happiness returns profits to be given to all aspects of the people so on and so forth so this is the essence of the holistic way of doing any kind of a decision making process the whole world is uh, you know considered to be a family and uh, the decision making has to be such that we are able to spread across the happiness to all the stakeholders who are associated with the business organizations of today the process is not oriented to interest of the companies alone in fact uh, our excellence should reach to the people at large the happiness of the organization should spill over to all the shareholders to all the stakeholders except uh, for the people who are a part of it we are definitely have the selfish motive to taking care of them but yes when you move on to the public at large community at large society at large we should be able to spread across the happiness all the corporate members who have worked together for good for all the people holistic decision making the the heart of it is the ethics so we call it as the ethical decision making process whatever decisions we take we have the ethical lens behind it so that there is no problem as far as uh, you know giving of the happiness to the people at large is concerned the success coming on to another paradigm the success of a business is determined by three c's let us have a look on this the first c is a capability the second c is a capital and the third c is connections and this is how it is the interplay of all the three c's that we move on to the business activities of today the business meets the market demand that is uh, whatever we produce the resources are directed towards uh, those uh, you know things wherein the people demand the good things for that so what we do we direct all the resources of the business towards that owing to the public demand of that particular good after that after taking care of uh, the uh, the public demand now we see our capabilities that whether we will be able to service the demands of the people or not so coming on to the second c that is the capability the capability capital and connections they go hand in hand and only then we will be able to generate the cash flow and we will be able to generate the profits this is this makes more sense that if all the three c's are work together that is the the capabilities the capital and connections then sky is the limit for any of the business organization the three c's enable a business to develop an aptitude towards the competition now we are living in a world of competition competition if you see in the right perspective will pull you up so we should not be avoiding the competition competition is a driving force it throws you up 
and we should not be able to you know do anything if the competition is not there. Why do we try and uh, build that competitive spirit in the sportsman because everyone wants to win. Similarly, this kind of a competitive force if it is present in the business organizations of today, everyone will work towards the pursue of you know the profits, everyone will pursue the, the path of success. So, this is how we move on and this is uh, the way it should be. The business thrives on truth and integrity in dealing with its customers, stakeholders and the society. It should develop the mutual trust among the uh, stakeholders and of course, we should be able to manage their expectations. Now, as a matter of fact, we uh, are working in a business system and everyone knows business system has its sub parts. And there are so many stakeholders which are linked and associated with that. We have stakeholders, we have creditors, we have employees, we have customers, we have exchequers that is the government of India. We, because we are whatever we are talking, we are talking from the Indian perspective. So, unless and until we work together as a force, we develop a, uh, an environment of trust and confidence, we will not be able to achieve the happiness, success and overall uh, the path of endeavors which is putting uh, the organization towards the path of excellence. Now, coming on to the aptitude towards the business is usually profit centric. Now, this is a very big statement which we have to consider. We are not talking about only the profit centric aspect. We are moving on to the customer delight. We are moving on to building relationships. So, now the, the, the things which were present in the yesteryear, they do not work today. If we are only working towards the profit centric forces, we will not be able to achieve the success. So, now there is a you know important paradigm shift and drift from the profit centric approach to the holistic approach. The holistic approach takes care of uh, so many parameters and paradigms and considerations and obligations which the business has to do. That is giving the best product to the customers, giving the best returns to the investors, taking care of all the obligations which you have to you know pay to the exchequer of the country, not bypassing any of the tax not bypassing any of the considerations, compliances, they should be done at the par excellence. And this is what we are trying to build up. We are trying to build up the best confidence towards the organization and the people and the interplay of all the three C's is going to uh, put the organizations on the top. And of course, uh, today we are professionally, uh, you know, having all the specializations in many aspects of the management. For example, the human resources, the real estate, the marketing, operations and finance. However, there is a still a limited research on the essence of the management. Henry Fiol divided the management into five important elements. The plan to organize, to command, to coordinate and to control. These are the basic uh, five functions of the management that is the primarily you have to plan that is where you are, where you want to go. Secondly, you have to make a organization structure accordingly, put the uh, authority responsibility structure in a right perspective. Neither the authority should be more, it is going to uh, you know uh, jeopardize everything because power has a negative impact also. You know, uh, the if you have more of the power, it uh, power corrupts. Uh, you know, it in endures the corruption, and the absolute power corrupts the organization absolutely. So there has to be a parity, a balance, a trade-off between the authority and the responsibility structures, and of course, uh, the organization should strive to pursue the functions of the management in a best possible extent. Now, according to Peter Drucker. The manager does his work by getting other things to do their endeavors. So, the business management also induces a communication commitment in addition to three C's. Together, we have five C's now, the essence of the business management. In order to be efficient, effective, the management should prepare the manager for the decision making process after taking into consideration these five C's. To make the business more profit centric, to the purpose centric management, the managers need to acquire the wisdom uh, from the ancient Hindu scriptures also. 
that is Sam, Dand, Bhed, etc. Now we are coming on to a very interesting and the last topic of today's lecture that is what Bhagavad Gita teaches us. So the essence behind the Bhagavad Gita which is directed towards the management with the topic of now. Bhagavad Gita was the first, it was first translated in England in 1785 by Sir Charles Wilkins. It is a world or longest poem that is the Hindu epic and is a part of Mahabharata written by Ved Vyasa. Its written documents were dated between 300 BC to 200 AD and it has about 700 shlokas that is verses and considered as a little shrine in the temple of Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita is an episode in the war of Mahabharata which covers the dialogue with Arjuna and a warrior Krishna and his chariot driver. Lord Krishna is one of the ten incarnations of Lord Vishnu, the Hindu god of growth. The Hindu believes in supreme being called Brahma and it is uh, without the qualities and the attributes neither existent nor non-existent and it is universally uh, you know the consciousness in eternity. Now we are moving on to the Mahabharata teachings. It promotes the knowledge for the applications of these three, uh, these five C's to the business management. The applications of Gita can be examined from the perspective of a manager that is the decision maker and the company. Our entire world is not real. It is all you know into a sham. It seems real but only uh, we live in ignorance. It is bound by endless chains of cause and effect karma to a cosmic process called samsarna salvation or moksha. It is achieved through the wisdom when the people forget their egos and achieve the perfect bliss in their life. The Hindus divine human efforts into four categories, Brahma that is the intellectuals, Kshatriyas that is the warriors, Vyasa that is the trade and finance and the Shudra that is the service. Through each category is unique in itself, the quality of individual action lies in the motive or desire that promotes the action. The actions are the wisdoms oriented and are not governed by the knowledge that can be acquired by learning, wisdom and born into the insight. The Brahma is the divine trinity comprising of Brahma that is the creative force, the Vishnu that is the preserving force and the Siva that is the destructive force. So all these forces have to be very nicely understood by each one of the student because unless and until you have the knowledge of these things, they are the best motivating forces which can you know put un, into a right perspective and into a right path when you talk about the business uh, you know the con contemporary business organizations. They all reinforce what we want to do. They all reinforce each other and exist concurrently and whenever the evil forces threaten to destroy the human beings or the human values a new avatara will come which will descend the divine appears in the human form. In Gita, the Krishna represents the embodiment of Vishnu to guide him to awaken the world and then to instruct. Similarly, when a student is ready, the teacher appears to awaken him. The role of teacher and guru is perhaps the most important thing which nobody can you know, uh, bypass and uh, perhaps the role which a teacher can perform, nobody else can do it. Because they have a selfless motive of you know putting the words into the student's mouth and of course awakening his knowledge etc. The supreme being is within everyone. <coughs> there is an Atman that cannot be destroyed by death and decay or corruption. Everyone does not understand this but you should invite a cause for the suffering and our physical form is the result of an inside tension behind it. So therefore a person enjoys an outward personality that is while restraining the ego by managing the gunas. So we should concentrate on our gunas and we should restrict and restrain and suppress our ego. These gunas and uh, the rightness which you have in you will you know uh, will put you on the top and avoids any kind of a confusion which is there. 
So, gunas influence the psychological condition of a person. And uh, the last of it, we can uh, you know put our work towards the detachment that is working without any kind of uh, attachment to any of the results that is nishkama karma. However, there is a distortions of our efforts and uh, we lose our concentrations, we lose our uh, you know the, the, uh, the focus and whatever we start doing we first see that what is the impact of our actions. In fact, there is another on the contrary of it the Bhagavad Gita teaches that, that we should move on and carry on with our activities without expecting the outcomes from your actions. With these words I hope the things are very clear to you and we will continue in the coming sessions. Thank you so much. With this note, we would like to thank Dr. Namita Rajput for giving us this productive session and uh, she has taught us uh, the teachings of uh, life. Uh, dear friends, we know that you have lots and lots of questions in mind and uh, if you wish to share your questions with us uh, or if you give, want to give your feedback to this particular lecture, then do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. We are going to upload this lecture on YouTube very soon and you are requested to see the lecture the, the number of times you wanted and afterwards if you wish to give your feedbacks, your feedbacks are welcome. We are taking your leave with the promise that we are going to meet again soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again.